Hey there everyone, I'm Cora and I'm here with the fantastic Ron Friends. How are you today? I'm fantastic, thank you for asking. <laughs> Apparently, I'm fantastic. <laughs> of course you're fantastic. Okay, thank you. Now, I always wondered, and I always ask this to artists, what got you into drawing? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I've been drawing all my life, literally. I was, if it's, pos if it's possible to be born with a pencil in my hand, I was born with a pencil in my hand. I, I can't remember a time when I wasn't drawing. Literally cannot remember a time uh, as a child that I wasn't drawing. Uh, my dad was, at the time, a paper salesman, so there were always reams of stock paper <laughs> around to draw on, and that's what I did. So uh, for me, it was a very natural extension, you know, uh, copying from newspaper strips and from comic books. And, and uh, I had a brother three years older, so comic books were already around. and. Uh, it's just, it's been a love of mine from the very beginning. From the time I was eight, if you asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, it was to, to grow up, work for Marvel Comics, and draw Spider-Man. So I've had a very directed, blessed life. So, <laughs> so is Spider-Man your favorite superhero? I would say probably after all the equivocation and everything, I think it would always come down to Spider-Man. Yes, yes I do. What appeals to you about the character? Uh, the fact that he, of all the character, well, the, uh, all the things that Stan did to make Spider-Man different, which was, uh, you know, when we when you're a kid, you're expected to relate to the sidekicks, and Stan mm -hmm. broke that paradigm by making Spider-Man a teenager, and yet he was the lead, and you can project yourself into the character because of the full face mask, and and he's so incredibly clay-footedly human and you know you it is very I mean the, the, the character is tailor-made to relate to so and that I, I reacted to all of those same things that, that everybody did and uh, you really felt like you were checking in with a friend every month you know I mean I, I and when I when I was privileged enough to work on the title with Tom DeFalco the legendary Tom DeFalco um, we always talked about Pete uh, we never talked about Spider-Man and Pete as separate entities or anything. The book was about Pete. Sometimes he wore the spandex suit, sometimes he didn't, but it was Pete, you know. What was it like working with Tom DeFalco? I was a pain in the ass. <laughs> I, mainly because he's so self-effacing and so accepting of other people's ideas that, you know, you immediately recognize his greatness and yet he's always denying it and and you're constantly and then you realize oh wait a minute he's just doing that so everybody else will tell him how fantastic he is <laughs> so it really is kind of sad and pathetic and as he's gotten older it's gotten worse you know because I mean when the conversations like the five minutes into every conversation he, get, he does the whole am I pretty thing do you think I'm pretty you don't do that to other freelancers that's not fair that's not fair because none of us are. None of us are. <laughs> no. And to the viewers at home, Tom DeFalco is sitting right here yeah. with us. He's right to my right, which is <laughs> wrong when you think about it. He used to be a male model. I could Un see it. Underwear. Under see? She can see that. I could see it. I could see that. He was always the before pictures. <laughs> anyway. I'm going to let that sit for a minute. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so in your history, you also worked for, D for DC. Yes, what was I that did. like? Um, I only went to DC because Marvel had no work for me. But um, I was, again, very blessed and very privileged to get a chance to work on the Superman title for a brief time. Um, uh, you know, work at Marvel had dried up. Uh, Marvel had gone through an odd business period where they had canceled half their line, and I got caught up in that and uh, was offered work over at DC and took it and became part of the, 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 there were four Superman titles a month, so it was a huge team effort. And I became part of that for a while during some, uh, during the period of time where he married Lois and during the period of time that he put on a ridiculous blue and white costume with electric bolts on it that oh, I designed. That, <laughs> that, uh, that he did that for like a year in 97, you know. So uh, I still wear the watch because you know, it's actually kind of cool to be able to say that, you know, you pissed all over Superman for a couple of years. 
And it makes a cool watch. And that's why people do it. To this day, <laughs> that's why people screw around with Superman, because he's an icon. And you actually, in this, in this industry, you get like, you, you, people know you for that. And, you know, you, you get to af affect an icon. And that's really kind of strangely satisfying. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I go to Metropolis, Illinois for the Superman celebration. I go into the <laughs> Superman Museum, and there are posters and action figures from when he was the electric blue Superman. And, you know, whatever you think of it, I contributed to it, and <laughs> that's kind of neat. You, know, so. you do have a history of working with superheroes when they have alternate costumes. Nah, yeah, they, they say that. You, you looked on the web, didn't you? They say that oh. on the web. Yeah. And none of them were my fault. <laughs> I mean, none of them were my idea. The, the Spider-Man black costume thing was all decided before I got there. Uh, when they showed me the sketches, I thought it was a new villain. And they said, no, it's his new suit. And I said, well, why would he need a new suit? He has the best suit in the business. And, and I did what I was told. Uh, with Thor, it was Tom DeFalco's idea. <laughs> and I did design the, the revised version and, of course, designed Thunderstrike and everything. But that was all Tom. And with Superman, it was going to happen anyway. And what they did is with the, the four teams, they opened it up and they said, if you want to submit a, a, a sketch, feel free. These are the parameters. He's going to have electric-based powers. It ser serves as a containment suit and all this. And for, I actually think one of the reasons they might have picked mine was simply because I was, I was one of the few that, that dared to, like, screw with the logo. You know, I gave mm -hmm. them another logo to, to market and to, uh, to have people respond to. And uh, I, I, have, I actually think that's one, one of the reasons mine got chosen. But uh, it, it was, you know, but again, it, none of them were my idea. I, for me, it was in a kind of an afterthought. I wasn't going to submit something. But at the end of a work day, I had a couple of ideas kicking around and decided to go ahead and put them on paper. I sent them in. And the next thing I knew, they had, uh, they had chosen mine. And we got a very generous uh, extra payment for it. But now you look around and there's all these action figures for an idea that everybody doesn't seem to like too much. There's <laughs> dozens of different action figures of the electric blue Superman, which I, I don't see any money for because they paid me off. But what can <laughs> I tell you? I'm cheap. <laughs> I'm cheap. <laughs> Hey everybody, it's Chris again, and I'm here with someone who many consider a legend in the business. A living legend, thank you. A, a living legend. Ladies and gentlemen, Alan Bellman. M Mr. Bellman, it's an honor to speak with you. I, I, with, wow, where to begin? You were quite literally there at the beginning of the golden age of comics. Tell us about that. Well, first let me bless the photographer. <laughs> it all began in uh, 1942. I saw an ad in the New York Times. They wanted a background artist for Captain America. And I told my dad I'll go tomorrow because it was Columbus Day. No, he said, you go today. And uh, we went back and forth, but I listened to him. I went up, it was the McGraw-Hill building, I believe 30th or what's 34th, and uh, Don Rico, who was doing the Young Allies, came out, took my samples in, came back in about 10 minutes or five minutes, you hire, start Monday, and that's how it all began. I mean, you're, you've worked on the, I mean, you've worked on Captain America, you've worked on other titles, I mean, it's just, wow, I, 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 I just always was, curious about that creative process in those days. Well, you know, I started doing Captain America backgrounds and then later on, shortly after they gave me my own script, I think the first story I did was uh, called The Patriot, which died after the war ended. So he went the way of all uh, flesh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm just curious in particular about, especially the comics industry during uh, during um, World War II, which which you were a part of, and a lot of it was that a lot of it was part of the um, the war effort. I mean, there was a lot of stuff that was done. It was just patriotic, and it was telling stories, uh, you know, and boosting morale. I, I've always wondered about that. Well, the Allies didn't win the war. Yeah. Superman, 
Captain Marvel, Captain America, Spider-Man. Well, no, not Spider-Man. He came a little later. You know, after 50, I should be excused for these mistakes. <laughs> but uh, they won the war, actually, if you want to, you know, if you read comic books. And my favorite drawing I do right now is Captain America, you know, Belton Hitler, or the Red Skull. That's, I mean, still, that's, a, that's, that's an epitomous picture that, you know, people to this day, when they see, they think of Captain America in that era, they think of, you know, get well, an old pop pow, across the Zam, pow, wow, that's, exactly. the, that's the language used in the comic book industry. <clears throat> now, I, I've always been curious, because, you know, you've, you've, been in, you've been in this business, well, you were in this business for years, and I, I'm curious what your thoughts about modern about the modern comics, you know, after the Silver Age into the modern era as uh, compared to the Golden Age? Well, you know, a lot of people still like the old way of drawing comics, and I still draw Captain America the way they want to see it. I don't give them shiny buckles, or I don't give them shiny this, or new boots. I draw them the way I know he should be drawn. And what they're doing today is to modernize the characters. And the artists that draw today are, you know, forget about computers. It still has to be drawn. These young gentlemen who draw today are extremely beautiful artists. They, they draw well. And the new age of color and computers, but still it has to be drawn. I tip my hat to today's artists, but they still love the way that it was drawn in the 40s and 50s, and I could still give it to them. And that's why I'm called to convention after convention. I did 10 last year and about 10 this year, and I'm planning to go back to San Diego this year oh, wow. to help celebrate 75 years of Marvel Comics. And I'll be proud, and I know this year I was, Marvel invited me, they thought I'd be in San Diego this uh, last year, and they wanted me for their booth and signing and to a private party. And I look forward to this in the upcoming uh, year. And uh, if anything, of any kind, of any convention, if I have to crawl there, I want to be in San Diego for the 75 years of Marvel. I was there. I have, I, I have a feeling, Mr. Bellman, you, you will definitely be there, and you're going to have a great time. I'm, i I got to ask you one question, though. What, uh, I heard a story about you in a, a Superman number one. No, no, I, I bought the first issue of, uh, of Action Comics, oh. which introduced Superman, Superman. yeah. And uh, that was inspired. I was inspired by that, and... Uh, uh, Jerry Siegel and, and Joe Simon, uh, no, Joe Schuster, I'm Schuster. sorry, uh, inspired me to go ahead and, and become a comic book artist. As I always wanted to draw, tell stories, yeah. And I tell you, it, it, it's rare that we, we find someone who, who, is, who has been just in this business for so many years, who's done such amazing work and is so humble. Thank you. No. You were supposed to ask me if I still had that copy. Oh, no. Do you still have that copy? Would I be sitting here if I had that first no, copy? No, I don't think you would. Get out of here, rotten ah. kid. <laughs> <laughs> and allow me to say this. Let's try to get along with everyone. We can't be everyone's friend, but let's try. Amen. And peace and good health to you all. And God bless America. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Hey, guys, it's Jason the X. I'm here with one of my favorite writers. This is Mr. Ron Mars. Ron, thank you for having a little Jason, bit of time for, with us. Thanks for coming by. I appreciate it. Okay, you've, you've written Witchblade. You've written, uh, well, actually, your current titles, uh, it's Shinku? Shinku from Image. Shinku, and then Ravine. Ravine from uh, Top Cow Image. And you're also back on Witchblade. Back on Witchblade. Uh, mm -hmm. Other irons in the fire. Now, as, as a writer, you... You went through the whole Emerald Twilight storyline, which a lot of people had varying opinions on. Sure. Because it was the fall of uh, Hal Jordan. But honestly, for me, that was my jumping on point for Green Lantern. Because I could look at Green Lantern and I could see this guy looks like me. Right. So it was a, it was a, that's where 
I fell in love with the character. And you've gone back to that character multiple times, though. You've written Ion and... Uh, well, what, what made you write Kyle Rayner? What, what was the appeal of him? You know, the, the offer from DC was really, you know, this is what, we, this is what we're going to do with Green Lantern. Uh, do you want to be the one to do it? Uh, because there was, you know, th they had decided that they wanted to have a major storyline that would remove Hal Jordan from being Green Lantern. So, so whether I wrote it or somebody else did, that was the story that was going to be told. Um, so, you know, initially they called me and said, do you want to write Green Lantern? I'm like, oh yeah, that'd be cool. Hal's pretty cool and I love that Gil Kane costume. And then they went, oh wait a minute, here's what we're actually going to do. So, um, so I had to think about it. I thought about it for, you know, a week or so, I think, before I actually took the gig. And, you know, it turned out that it was, it was the best of both worlds for me because I got to play in the DC Universe. I got to play with all those toys. But I got to have a main character that didn't have 40 years of continuity baggage attached to him. And I could, and I could approach the DC Universe in a fresh way from a character perspective uh, because I was doing it through the eyes of a character who was brand new to this world. Kind of take some of the pressure off. Of you. Well, it, you know, we knew that we were going to have readers because of what we were doing with Hal. The pressure was to make sure that we kept those readers by introducing a character that people responded to. Um, and, and thankfully, you know, enough of the readership stuck around that, that Kyle had a nice long run as Green Lantern. And currently still has one. Sure. Right so tell us about Shinku. What's uh, what's going on with Shinku? Uh, Shinku is uh, is actually on a bit of an unplanned hiatus right now because uh, we've been uh, stockpiling penciled art, but we've uh, we've got to get the color situation on the book uh, sorted out. But it's uh, it's a creator-owned book that we're doing through Image. Uh, it's a modern-day samurai vampire hunter uh, that we started a few years ago because we felt like you know I'd seen enough vampires that spark. I'd seen enough vampires that were them all. that were more interested in going on dates than they were actually in being vampires. So, um, you know, the, the concept we had before Twilight was even a thing, but it seemed more, uh, it seemed like a story we wanted to tell even more because uh, as a little bit of a backlash to, uh, to the kind of vampires that have become popular, because that's, those aren't the kind of vampires that I grew up with. I grew up with, you know, uh, Bla Bella Lugosi in black and white, and and you know Christopher Lee in glorious color and, right and the hammer heart. Right yeah, uh, so um, you know, vampires are I think never go out of style, um, but I like mine that I like mine to be the bad guys, or at least be a badass. Yeah, yeah, I, you know, hopefully, Shinku's vampires are, um, you know, they're the bad guys, but also somewhat understandable, somewhat relatable in that they are. Uh, you know these centuries-old beings who sort of work work under the under the radar of the society, society and control a lot of the society. And uh, what this really came out of was kind of looking at the at the uh, comparisons between what vampires might be like and what uh, samurai were like. The, the the samurai historically sort of were the warrior class lived apart from. Uh, lived lived by a different set of rules as, that everybody else did. Could sort of get away with whatever they wanted to do with impunity in a lot of ways, uh, because they were the warrior caste. And so we we transferred that sensibility of uh, these people who lived above the peasants to the vampires. Uh, and I'm a sucker for a samurai story anyway. So we kind of threw that all into the blender and came up with this. Sweet, which is a great concept. Okay, and you're also doing Ravine. Tell us about that. Uh, Ravine is another creator-owned book that I do with uh, the artist Stjepan Sejic, who is from Croatia. Um, it's a, we call it a big fat fantasy. It's the, it's the, it's the cut from the same cloth, hopefully, as uh, Lord of the Rings, Game of Thrones, uh, that sort of stuff that's got, uh, you know, dragons and magic and, uh, you know, villainous villains and strong, sturdy warriors. Uh, everything you want in a fantasy book hopefully is in there. Um, and it's a story that uh, Skapon has been sort of piecing together for the last 10 years or so. Um, and eventually asked me if I wanted to come in and, and co-write with him, uh, you know, help with the story, polish the dialogue. So it's, uh, it's co-owned by the two of us now and uh, volume one is out. 
Uh, volume two should be out within the next month or so, depending on press times. And th the plan is to do uh, 10 to 12 uh, original graphic novels to tell this entire epic story. Uh, it's a it's a lot of work, but you know, the, we decided probably to our financial detriment to do it as uh, a series of original graphic novels because we felt like telling it in 20 page increments like you do in a normal monthly comic was not going to be a satisfying storytelling method for this because there are so many characters, there are so many story threads. We felt like we had to give you 160 pages at once to give you a satisfying meal. So, so we'll continue with it as a series of OGNs. Cool. Okay. As a fan of your work, I, I have to ask you, what do you think your best work is? Um, or can you answer that question? I don't know. That's always like trying to, you know, decide which which one of your kids you like the best. Uh, uh, I want to make sure I have it. Okay. Um, my collection. So. You know, if you know, I love Shinku. I love Ravine um, because those are those are my kids. You know, those are are stories that uh, that didn't exist before we we came to them. Um, but if I had to pick one thing for you to read, I would probably say it's Samurai Heaven and Earth from Dark Horse, which is um, ten issues so far. There'll be a there'll be a third series. Uh, it's a historical samurai adventure that I did with Luke Ross and. Uh, you know that one was never like work at all. It was just it was a story that was there. Luke and I decided to do it together, and you know it it all the parts fit properly. Uh, I don't I don't know why. I don't. It took an American writer and a Brazilian artist to tell the story of a Japanese swordsman in you know musketeer era France, but it all fell into place. Okay, there you go. I like it. I love it. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. Thank you it. very much, Mr. Clark. I appreciate it. Oh, wait a minute. Tell me, he said I could call him Rob, so I'm going to call him Rob. He let me call him Rob. That's my buddy here. Yeah.